Well, good morning, everyone. We want to welcome you this morning to the San Antonio African American Community Archive and Museum's virtual discussion about the impact of fraternal organizations from slavery to civil rights. SACAM is excited to have you take part in this uh, informative discussion. Uh, we will welcome your comments, suggestions, even your questions. We do have a Q and A section where you will be able to type in your questions if you should so choose to address it to a certain organization or individual, please designate that as well in the Q and A and we will get to them um, as we can. This morning, I wanna to introduce to you all our esteemed moderator. She is the current president of the Panhellenic Council and she's also the current historian for the Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Alpha Pi Zeta chapter. Please welcome everyone, Ms. Gwendolyn Aquindo. Good morning. As you've heard, I'm Gwendolyn Oquendo, San Antonio Panhellenic, National Panhellenic Council President, and I'm here to discuss with you today the fraternal and Greek organizations presidents and historians who've joined us and their contributions in San Antonio since their beginning. Our San Antonio African American community benefits from the pioneering work of many in social and civic engagement. And today is our opportunity to share some of our story from the start of the organization to 1965. The African-American fraternal organizations precede our Greek organizations and a great deal of the foundation and framework was laid by their efforts. Let us start with our discussion. Mr. Burrell Palmer, the historian for the San Antonio Lodge Number no. 1, Prince Hall, Free and Accepted Masons. Good morning, Mr. Palmer. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Some of the questions that we have discussed earlier, we'd like to have you enlightened this morning. So my question for you is, when was your organization chartered in San Antonio? Uh, San Antonio Law number one, I'm representing two. So uh, San Antonio Law number one, and also Musa Temple 106, Press Hall Shriners. So San Antonio number one was chartered in May of 1876. Uh, we first came to San Antonio in 1871. Uh, so Prince Hall Masonry, which began for us in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, back in 1775, spread across the United States. So when it got to Kansas, uh, a person named William D. Matthews came to San Antonio and chartered the first lodge here, which was San Antonio Lodge number 22. So in 1875, 
the five lodges that were in the area, Houston, Brenham, Galveston, Austin, got together in Brenham and created the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Texas. And we were recharged in 1876 as San Antonio Lodge number one. Thank you. And what are some of the ways your organizations has contributed to the San Antonio community? Well, it's one thing, and if I can do this, it's something that I wanted to read uh, from our Grand Lodge historian, Frank Jackson, who was also the uh, previous mayor of Prairie View. And it states that the Prince Hall Grand Lodges, via the power of the local lodges, came to epitomize the ideal of enduring institution capable of breaking down the walls of his castle, which served as a deliberating regulator of social control. It was the Masonic lodges that were believed to be culturally capable of providing blacks access to the corridors of power and the mainstream of American society where men must meet as equals. The Masonic lodges therefore became the institutions of choice outside the churches that provided African-American leaders a way by which the people can attain their higher cultural Strikings. So basically, all that means is that basically when men join the fraternity, because Freemasons are men, and that they take the thing that they learn and to better themselves as men, the brotherhood under the fatherhood of God, to bring about change in their community. So my lodge, like I said, 1871, uh, was made up of very professionals. Uh, one of the person that I admire is uh, Abraham Grant, who was a bishop in the AME Church, who came here from Florida in 1878. He was the pastor of the St. James AME Church that's now on the west side of town. And he was a member of my lodge as well. And he went on to become the fourth grand master of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Texas. Uh, others like uh, Dr. and I have his name right here, Dr. Charles Andrew Sr. Uh, who was here back in the early 1920s and 30s, who was a graduate of Howard Medical School. And he was here and, you know, he paved the way for a lot of things for Blacks because he was able to have a clinic here and take care of young children that couldn't afford or at the time, uh, Santa Rosa Hospital would not care for them. So a lot of our Prince Hall Masons that have briefly gone on to glory have done a lot of things in our community. Uh, I saw some of the names of the other uh, fraternal orders and some of those names are Masons and as well. Uh, I saw G.J. Sutton, who was the first black uh, state representative here out of San Antonio. He was a Prince Hall Mason. And also he was a Shriner in Musa Temple as well. And so, you know, I'm proud to be a, a Prince Hall Mason here in San Antonio and also a Shriner and uh, things we do and just outstanding to be here. And it's just the thing about it is, is that we take good men and make them better. And also they take what they learn from us and better our community. Well, thank you for that information. I appreciate it. And I know the experiences that you shared with us will resonate with our community. Can you tell me more about the Musa Temple number 106 since you are a Shriner and we appreciate your efforts here today? Sure. So Prince Hall Shriner, we're Prince Hall affiliated which means that uh, we're also made up of Masons uh, in order to be a member. And we were established by uh, 13 Prince Hall Masons under the leadership of John George Jones in Chicago and back in June 3rd of 1893. Uh, we are a national organization. Uh, we have about 35,000 members and over 230 shrine temples and courts, daughters of the Imperial Court throughout the world. Okay, and basically we are a benevolent charitable organization and we have the principle of fostering civic, economic and educational development programs throughout our domain. Uh, Luther Temple was established on August 2nd, 1921. And we'll be celebrating really, we celebrating our 100 year anniversary next year. <laughs> so uh, we're, proud of, we're proud of that. Uh, one of the key things with the Shrine National Organization is that back in August of 1914, we were sued. And we were sued by the white Shriners because basically they said that we couldn't be Shriners as well. And so on June 3rd, 1929, our case was heard by the United Supreme Court and we won. And what that did for us is that decision, if 
by the nine Supreme Court justices upheld the rights to work and be recognized as Shriners. It also legitimized Prince Hall masonry in the country, as well as all other fraternal orders comprised of black members, which are similar organization, doctrine, purpose, and those as, as those who work opposed to white, white, white organizations. So that's one of the things that we do. So every June 3rd, closest Sunday, we hold our Jubilee Day service and we ensure that our member and the public remember what those nobles did back in the day that paved the way for us to be here now. Well, thank you for that. And also, can you share, based on everything that you have talked about this morning, the organizations, members that are not in your organizations, how do they benefit from your Shriner organization? Well, we have four pillar programs. Uh, Shriners as Mentors, uh, National Diabetes Initiative, Voter Registration Education, and we provide student aid. So here in San Antonio, that's what we do on an annual basis. Uh, we're getting ready to do a lot of great things uh, in, in 2021, uh, but we do this throughout our history. Uh, as I did some research, especially for my lodge and the Shrine, we did a lot of great things. So for example, we donate to the Prince Hall Medical Research Grant, United Negro College Fund. Uh, here in San Antonio, we would host uh, scholarship beauty pageants for young ladies between the ages of 17 and 24. Uh, we also uh, have program fighting against drugs, crime, and delinquency. Uh, and also, uh, we would host parties and stuff for kids, you know, in the area, especially Whitney Courts and Sutton Homes. And so, uh, and also in the 1950s, uh, the temple would hold annual tuberculosis cancer fund dances, and then the Keyhole Nightclub uh, on the 4th of July. Thank you. I appreciate you sharing uh, your history. It's vast, and we look forward to hearing more from you. Thank you. You're welcome. The San Antonio National Panhellenic Council includes nine Greek organizations with five fraternities and four sororities. We were chartered in 1972 in San Antonio and have building, been building on our collective principles together since that time. With the San Antonio National Panhellenic Council of our nine organizations, we have eight present this morning. I'd like to start with the Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. If you would, Mr. John Gordner, will you join us please? Good morning, Mr. Gardner. Mr. Gardner? Yes. Uh, good morning. Um, good morning. Now, Mr. John Gardner is with uh, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, Del Delta Rho Lambda Chapter. And our question for you this morning is, where were you chartered and when were you chartered in San Antonio? Um, we were chartered in San Antonio in, um, uh, we, well, we took on the um, aims of our founding fathers in 1906. We were actually chartered in San Antonio in uh, September, the third, 1949, by uh, seven young men that returned from college and uh, formed a, uh, a chapter here in San Antonio and it was chartered there on September the 3rd, 1949. And why were you chartered? Was, what, was there a developing need for alpha men in San Antonio? Yes, there were. At that time, uh, there uh, I, we thought there were the, well, the seven, uh, well, the eight young men that started this uh, chapter felt that there was a need to, to uh, promote and uh, carry on the uh, aims of the national chapter that was established in 1906 by uh, our founding brothers there. And it was, an, uh, we thought it was a need to uh, uh, 
get other uh, introduce ourselves to the community, work in the community, and establish a uh, presence for African American men here in San Antonio. Well, I thank you for that, and we look forward to hearing more from Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Delta Rho Lambda Chapter in the future. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. You're welcome, sir, ma'am. Our first Greek sorority is Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, and locally the chapter is Alpha Tau Omega Chapter, and their president, Ms. Marilyn Stanton White, is here with us this morning. Good morning. Good morning, Sister Gwendolyn. I'm very happy to be here. And uh, congratulations on your 90th charter anniversary in San Antonio. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we were the first Greek organization that was chartered in San Antonio on November 15th, 1930. And uh, we were blessed on uh, last Sunday uh, to worship at the oldest black church, uh, St. Paul United Methodist Church, where our charter members held their uh, worship service right after they had their chartering ceremony. And it ha happened to be on the same day. So that was a great day for us. Wonderful. Uh, why do you think there was a need for a charter in chapter in San Antonio? Well, uh, the ladies back then really felt that there was a need to expand the mission of Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority on a local level. So we wanted to reach out and raise the status of African Americans, particularly girls and women. So we needed to provide for the poor, to serve the sick and the underserved, initiate social action to advance human and civil rights. And we work collaboratively with other groups uh, in order to extend our outreach in the community and uh, to lend to the credo of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, service to all mankind. Well, we were um, informed with some of your history with the video that we saw before the show. However, we'd like to hear more from you about your contributions in San Antonio from the political to the philanthropy. Well, uh, in the 40s, we were very involved with the NAACP, and we focused on grassroots uh, push for education. We went door to door campaigning for uh, people to register to vote. Um, we still push for the registration for the vote. Uh, in fact, we went to uh, the Phyllis Wheatley High School and assisted citizens in San Antonio with filling out their voter registration forms and making sure that they were mailed. And we were one of the first chapters to deputize chapter members so that they could canvass the precincts and uh, go out and register voters. Um, we also, in the 40s and 50s, we worked very closely with the NAACP to help abolish segregation and to maintain citizens' rights and engage in anti-segregation litigation uh, locally. We were very active in the sit-ins uh, that were taking place in San Antonio. Uh, some may remember the uh, Woolworths. Uh, why can't I say Woolworth this morning, but uh, the Woolworth store and going down downtown and having sit-ins uh, in order to uh, make the community see that African Americans belonged everywhere in the city, not just on the east side and uh, suffering from segregation. Well, thank you for your contributions in Alpha Tau Omega Chapters presence in San Antonio. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Mr. Jonathan Stanfield is a representative from Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated, San Antonio Alumni Chapter. Good morning, Mr. Stanfield. Good morning, Mr. Stanfield. Good morning, good morning, good morning. <laughs> when was your organization chartered in San Antonio? So the San Antonio Alumni Chapter of Kappa Alpha Psi was chartered on May 22nd, 1931 here in San Antonio. Okay. So since your charter, how have your contributions 
impacted residents in San Antonio that are not a part of your organization? So uh, regarding San Antonio, uh, one of our many key principles is that we, we seek to inspire service in the public's interest. And so we um, are very adamant about filling in blanks where there's void, uh, being of assistance where, where we are uh, to need be of assistance. Throughout our history here in the city, we've hosted food drives, uh, school supply drives, as many of those uh, part of other organizations have stated, uh, we've been a part of the NAACP as well as voter registration. And all of those endeavors are not just for one community or one individual uh, set of individuals within the San Antonio community, but to all individuals within the city. And so we have always sought to make sure that our presence is felt not just on the east side of San Antonio, but throughout the entire city, assisting wherever it is that we're needed. Well, thank you, Mr. Stanfield. Your contributions to the community are greatly appreciated. Thank you and Kappa Alpha Psi, San Antonio Alumni Chapter. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, Psi Alpha Chapter, Mr. Scott Earl, good morning. Good morning, ma'am, how are you? I am fine. I'm glad to hear that you're here to share with us some information about the Psi Alpha chapter, uh, what's your ways that you have contributed to the San Antonio community in your chapter? They're varied and each of the organizations have mentioned and we'll start with politics. One of the things that we brought to the San Antonio since we became a chapter here on November 1st of 1940, one of our charter members, Valmo Bellinger, who was the editor in chief of the San Antonio Registry, which was the largest African-American newspaper in the South from 1931 to 1979. He also was a party boss. He was responsible for garnering a lot of the votes that various political candidates wanted from the black community. He and his father, Charles Bellinger, were very responsible for getting people to come out and vote and make a lot of the changes within the city. And in 1941, when Moy Maverick was running for mayor of San Antonio, he was very upset and said, we don't need the black vote. And he was very upset that Charles Bellinger was able to switch the vote from him to his the person at the black community. So in the politics starting with Valmo Bellinger, we were very strong in showing that the blacks of the city were a voice to be reckoned with. Also at that time, his brother, who was a Psi Alpha member, Harry Bellinger, was the first black graduate of the University of Pennsylvania Wharton School of Business, and he was the first black graduate of their law school. He is known as the third grid marshal of Texas. And Thurgood Marshall himself was an honorary pallbearer at his funeral. If you recall when blacks could not go to UT, the lawyer that represented Mr. Sweat to sue University of Texas was Harry Bellinger. And because of that case, we, we were able to reap the benefit of the Texas Southern University who was able to get a law school because of the work of those two. In addition, Claude Black, who was a member of Psi Alpha Chapter, who's known for his work as clergy, but also a civil rights leader, also coined the Martin Luther King of Texas. He was mayor pro tem, the first black mayor of San Antonio pro tem and very active in the community. We also can go on to our work with youth. Before our chapter came here to the city, many of the members worked with the YMCA. If you go to the YMCA today, the Davis Scott, the first picture you see is W.B. Heard, who is a local dentist. Him and G.P. Inge, who was the principal for 20 years at Wheatley High School, they were responsible for getting that land that you see today on the east side of the Davis Scott. And they also responsible for getting the most members and raising the most money at that time. In addition to what we did in the community, as all many of us on the call know, San Antonio was the first integrated city in the South. By 1960, all, all restaurants, all schools were integrated within our city and all of our members of the Divine Nine were responsible. But one of the things that the city did look at is in 1960, when we had a 47th conclave here, they looked at the amount of black men that came to this city in coat and tie and showed a different side of what people in San Antonio thought of the black community. So those are some of the things that we brought to the city, ma'am, that I think assisted everyone, just not the Greeks. Well, I appreciate that. and. I know I don't have to ask, but I want to know anyway, how do you measure your success of these contributions? 
really how I measure it is when you talk to great grandparents, grandparents in this community, if you look at what our charter members did through Wheatley High School, many people talk of Wheatley, but it was a beacon, not just in the black community, but throughout all the Anglo schools measured themselves. They were the first school through the leadership of our charter member, Mr. G.P. Inge Jr. to go ahead and have no pass, no play. Many African-Americans looked at their way out of San Antonio and out of there through sports. So he told them, you know what, before it was a rule in the state of Texas, many decades later, Wheatley High School brought no path, no play, no pass, no play. So I think that is one thing that we measure that if you talk to anyone in this community, they bring up Mr. Inge, they bring up the readings of the San Antonio Register. So I think that's how I measure our accomplishments in this great city. Well, we thank you and we thank Psi Alpha Chapter and Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. Good morning, Mr. Earl. In our Greek community, we have Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated, who was founded at Howard University in Washington, D.C. on January 9, 1914, by three young African-American male students. The founders, A. Langston Taylor, Leonard F. Morris, and Charles I. Brown, wanted to organize a Greek letter fraternity that would exemplify the ideals of brotherhood, scholarship, and service. The fraternity is the only one of its kind to aid in the creation and holds a constitutional bond with the predominantly African-American sorority, Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. The fraternity was incorporated on January 31st, 1920 in Washington, DC. And our local chapter, Beta Beta Sigma was chartered in 1926 in San Antonio, Texas. At this time, I'd like to introduce to you Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, Alpha Phi Zeta Chapter, Ms. Tracy Oselin. Good morning, Ms. Oselin. Good morning. What are some ways your organization has contributed to San Antonio, be it politic, youth development, mentoring, public health, or other philanthropic or civic activities? Well, for starters, Velma Butler, who served as our Alpha Phi Zeta Chapter President from 1959 to 1961, was an educator and civic leader and pioneer in our local city government. And she was a very active member of the Hemisphere Planning Committee. Mabel Booker Lowry, who is a charter member of our chapter, um, was an educator in the San Antonio Independent School District. And she dedicated her entire life to educating youth here in San Antonio. And we are most proud that there's a scholarship named after her at the St. Phillips College that is able to continue her legacy along with the Alpha Pi Zeta chapter and the Alpha Pi Zeta Foundation. Our, one of our past presidents is um, Hazel Hayes, who was uh, very instrumental in the federal government here in San Antonio, as you know, we're Military City USA, and she served on Kelly Air Force Base, along with being a member of the NAACP and a pioneer in Blacks in government. Well, thank you for that information, but also, could you tell me how they have impacted or your contributions have impacted San Antonio residents that are not part of the organization? Well, locally, we've had school improvements with integration and grade progression. Um, with, it, with a lot of our members being educators, we've you know, provided mentoring and, and scholarships and awards to various students here in the San Antonio community. We continue to provide coaching and mentoring as we go on to further on our principle of scholarship. Our members are also part of the grassroots profile in San Antonio, and we've increased our efforts and profile in the, in the NWC and our equal justice efforts. Well, thank you, and I appreciate your contributions from Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. Ms. Oslin, have a good day. The premier opportunity to have a founding member of your national organization also be a part of your charter organization is a pleasure we have with Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, San Antonio Alumni Chapter. Good morning, Ms. Doris White Soares. Good morning. Would you share with us this morning why there was a need to charter a chapter in San Antonio of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated? Well, you know, as many have said, there's always a need to have black women who understand the power of sisterhood, 
who understand that when we rise, when the Black community rises, all communities rise. And it was easy for us to understand that in Delta Sigma Theta because, as you've said, we were blessed to have the presence of our national founder, Myra Lillian Davis Hemmings, a premier uh, theater woman, uh, a filmmaker. In fact, one of her films that she produced and co-wrote is, is a Black film classic. Um, but she was also, also into uh, uh, the work of, of women to lift up communities. One of her first public service efforts in DC was the Women's Suffragette March in 1913. And here in San Antonio, she helped us understand that we had to replicate that same sort of power. And we did so. We were the first non-governmental entity to form a Head Start when uh, President Johnson's wife, Lady Bird Johnson, called the Greek organizations to her office to say, help me get this started. And San Antonio Alumni Chapter answered that call in the summer of 1965. Um, and we did much, much more. And in fact, this is too small a segment in which to really talk about it. All the organizations probably feel that way. Uh, but but we, we feel that, that having Sora founder Hemings with us helped give us that extra push we needed to show San Antonio the power of Black women, the power of social consciousness, the power of collective action. Well, we thank you for that, but let's expand some more because we know there's a vast history in your chapter. Yes. Uh, politically, in youth community, mentoring public health, give us some more snippets of that wonderful history. Surely. Um, and. I personally feel like it has gone for hours, but let me tell you things that some people may know most about us. Um, most Delta women don't just sit on their hands and we were fortunate to have many Delta women like Harry, uh, uh, Sora Hattie Briscoe, who was the first black woman lawyer in San Antonio. Uh, I always looked up to her and I'm a lawyer and always was very proud to tell people there was just one woman lawyer in San Antonio when I was growing up and she was a Delta. But we also had my mother, who was the first black woman, Lois Pickle White, to run for a statewide office, countywide, uh, back in 1966. And we had Ruth Jones, our state legislature. Uh, so we've made a, a difference in politics, not only individually, but in getting the community ready to uh, exercise their franchise. I was going through some history last night and saw correspondence between our national body and the current chapter here to help us figure out how we were going to educate Blacks in the, in the mid-60s to come out and vote. Everyone didn't vote like they do today. Some people remember paying the poll tax, um, and, and we worked hard to get rid of those things. So I, we think that through our political action on the national and the social and the local level, we helped to bring San Antonio to where it needed to be here. Well, I thank you for that. And I've got one more question, even though I know that we could go on and on. Um, how do you measure the impact of your actions from the beginning of your charter in San Antonio to now? As we look back over our time here in San Antonio, the past 87 years, it, it, it might be difficult to measure, but there are some indicia we can use. One of the things we look at, we look at how many scholarship recipients there are. There are numerous women and some men recently who have benefited from our scholarships. I'm thinking of the Teen Lift program we had back in 1964, where we sent the young men on what we call the culture mobile uh, throughout the South to get a bird's eye view of uh, the burgeoning civil rights uh, movement through the South, but also the countless young men and women who now can say, I am somebody because money that San Antonio alumni chapter gave them helped push them on through school. We also look at the uh, various programs. We look at um, how many of the recipients of our social action and our public service tell us that they have benefited from it. Well, we thank you for your contribution to San Antonio community, and we look forward to more from Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated alumni chapter. Always, always. Thank you. Thank you. As we continue our discussion this morning, Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated, Alpha Phi Sigma Chapter. Good morning, Ms. Rashonda Darden. Good morning, thank you for having me. 
Good morning. Uh, we have heard so many of the contributions from the members of the San Antonio Panhellenic Council, but we will not be finished until we hear from Sigma Gamma Rho. So talk to us. Why is there a need to charter a chapter in San Antonio? Uh, the need to charter the chapter here in San Antonio, it was uh, chartered by 29 school teachers. Um, those teachers got together and recognized that there was an additional need for mentoring, uh, funds for scholarships, um, helping young mothers, unwed mothers um, to help enhance their quality of life. So those women got together, Willie Young Richardson, along with 28 other uh, women, and they chartered the Alpha Phi Sigma chapter here in um, October 6, 1945. Okay. And uh, what are some of the ways your contributions have helped the community? Um, so some of the ways that our um, contributions have helped the community, it definitely has enhanced um, the quality of life of the people here in San Antonio and the surrounding areas, as well so as we've been able to offer, like uh, the other Divine Nine, numerous scholarships to help individuals uh, achieve their, their dream of uh, a college degree. So um, as well so as we've uh, provided financial um, contributions to the NAACP, um, the United Negro College Fund. Um, we have the mentoring programs where we work with young women um, here in San Antonio, uh, teaching them a variety of topics to help them uh, once they uh, turn 18 and go out into society. So uh, we've been able to offer all those programs. Well, we're grateful to those contributions that you have made and your chapter has made. The uh, concern that uh, we all face is that how we measure our success and what's your unit of measurement for that? Um, I would think my unit of measurement would be those who have come back to help enhance the San Antonio community. Um, I, we've seen a lot of individuals who have uh, been uh, recipients of some of the uh, contributions of the Alpha Phi Sigma chapter. And I'm, I'm glad to say that some of them have been rowers and returned back to San Antonio and have even become sowers now to help continue uh, the legacy, to help enhance others' lives and to spread out you know, further across the surrounding cities here in San Antonio. Well, thank you, and I appreciate you empowering the community and women in San Antonio. Thank, thank you, you so and good morning, Ms. Darden. You too. Iota Phi Theta Fraternity Incorporated, the last of our Divine Nine in San Antonio, Mr. M. Edward Lane, good morning. Good morning, ma'am. I'm trying to share my video. I cannot for some reason. Good morning. Good morning, man. Glad to see your Good smiling morning. face. Um, we've talked about uh, the contributions of many from 19, whenever you were chartered, to 1965 in San Antonio. How can you measure the success of your contributions in San Antonio? Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, first of all, we were uh, chartered here at a, a later. Um, September 19th, 1963. And our contributions here to San Antonio, one of our founding members, Elias Dorsey Jr., uh, when he was a child, he came from Baltimore, Maryland, and he was a part of the sit-ins that were on, I believe, March 17th, 1960. Uh, as we all know, a lot of people came from north down south to visit their grandparents and their family. So that made a severe impact on him so that when he went back to Morgan State College, now known as Morgan State University, for him to uh, help uh, establish Iota Phi Theta. Iota Phi Theta is uh, uh, born out of the civil rights movement uh, because it was founded in 1963 now. So how the contributions that you have made impacted our residents that are not part of the organization? Because not everybody is a member of Iota Phi Theta or the Divine Nine. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, I think that we uh, we've been a bit actually benefit from the elite eight uh, in the fact of, that we took from their example and from them taking from us taking from their example. Uh, others have benefited because it is taught as members of IOTA Phi Theta how to conduct ourselves and how to be uh, somewhat of that example so that we can be better. Uh, 
not too unstable, uh, so that we can be uh, better members of society. Well, I thank you for that. And I'd like for all of the panelists to know and our audience that the fraternal and Greek organizations in San Antonio continue to move forward with the agenda of civic and civic engagement, but also the pillars of their organizations. With that said, this morning, we have heard from Mr. Burrell Harmer from the SA San Antonio Lodge Number no. 1, Prince Hall Free and Accepted Mason. He's also represented Shriners Musa Temple Number no. 106. We've heard from Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, Delta Rho Lambda Chapter, Mr. John Buddy Gardner. We've heard from Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Alpha Tau Omega Chapter, Marilyn Stanton White. We've heard from Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity, San Antonio Alumni Chapter, Jonathan Stanfield. We've heard from Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, Mr. Scott Earl, Psi Alpha Chapter. We've heard from Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, San Antonio Alumni Chapter, Ms. Doris White Soares. We've heard from Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, Alpha Phi Zeta Chapter, Tracy Oselin. Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated, Ms. Rashonda Darden. And Iota Phi Theta Fraternity Incorporated, Mr. M. Edward Lane. All of the contributions of the fraternal and Greek organizations have been footprints for us in our success as a community, but it is not over. We are thanking you for joining us this morning and we have committed to sharing more of our information through archives, in-depth presentations and one-on-one -on -one meetings with the San Antonio African-American Community and Museum. The contributions that were asked to share with us is just a snippet of our history. And we thank all that were present this morning. And I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Heather Williams to share the rest of the story. Thank you, Ms. Gwynn. I do appreciate all that you've done to moderate this session this morning. Um, we do have a few more minutes. So I would like to offer the opportunity to the organizations, if you'd like um, to say a little bit more in closing about each of your individual organizations. Um, would we, panelists, would we mind doing that this morning? We do have a little time. Well, the, this is Burrell. Uh, yes, I wanted to say that uh, I didn't get out, I didn't get the chance, of, I didn't forget, but. Uh, to say who were some of our leaders here locally. So for San Antonio Lot number one, that is Brother Robert Bonner Jr. Uh, he's our current master of the lodge. Uh, current, our current illustrious Pote, or our president for the local shrine temple here is Noble Derek Scott. Uh, our grand master for the state of Texas is most worshipful Wilbert M. Curtis. And also our national uh, for the shrine would be noble John T. Chapman. And but I'll leave it at that. So stand by for any questions. Um, if anyone else like to share their yes. local if, I, if I may, uh, Ms. Williams, this is Doris White Source for Delta Sigma Theta San Antonio Alumni Chapter. I would just like to, to share just a snippet of something I found when I was doing research. I was a, a, a kid here when Hemisphere opened in 1968. I had not known until I ran across some documents that there was uh, a Delta Day at Hemisphere. Perhaps there was a day for all the sororities, I just don't know. But there definitely was a Delta Day at Hemisphere. And uh, I was looking at some um, some, uh, some, some telegrams that had come in from deltas around uh, the country uh, congratulating San Antonio alumni on having a Delta Day at Hemisphere. I also would just like to, to let you know that the influence of Delta Sigma Theta wasn't just in San Antonio. Delta Sigma Theta has been a, a, a catalyst for much change in all of the state of Texas. Earlier this week, the Bryan Museum in Galveston, I'm sorry, last week, 
did a wonderful presentation on our national founder, Jesse McGuire Dent, a Galveston native who sued in 1943, a black woman sued the Galveston Independent School District to increase the pay of administrators, black administrators, black teachers, and black secretaries. That was Jesse McGuire Dent, one of our original founders and a dear friend of our local national founder, uh, Myra Davis Hemings. I just wanted to say this is the sort of thing that all of the black sororities can be proud of. Each black sorority has a very rich history. And I know that some of your audience may not be black. They need to understand though, that what we represent is the power of a people who can start at the bottom and rise up to the top uh, through hard work, through vigilance, through education, through uh, maintaining standards that they never let down. And I'm so proud to be a member of the National Panhellenic Council, to be a member of an organization that is a part of this esteemed council. And I'm just proud to be a part of each of you all. And I'm proud of all of your histories. I'm particularly proud of Africa for Africa's history. Okay, and you know why. So I, I just, I just all, of, all of us should pat ourselves on the back because there are so many little girls around the world and boys too who would look at us and feel that they could be, they could be better too. Thank you. So um, thank you so much, uh, Sister uh, Delta Doris for um, acknowledging that we are all very interested in the community. You know, Alpha Ta Omega, uh, was one of the, well, it was the first sorority that was allowed to have a float uh, in the parade during Fiesta. And so that arose to uh, us being able to have a Greek float every year. Uh, that was in 1950, let's see, I have it right in front of me, maybe not, but that happened early on. Uh, we also chartered two undergraduate chapters here in San Antonio. So we were able to uh, spread that mission through our younger uh, ladies, both at our citywide chapter, Delta Rho, and then our chapter at, at UTSA. Um, we hold uh, one of the largest fundraisers here normally in November. We have Fashionetta and all of the uh, proceeds that come from Fashionetta go out to education, they go to scholarships. And as a part of our push for HBCUs, Alpha Tau Omega adopted St. Phillips. And so we are able to give about $3,000 every year just to St. Phillips. And it's particularly uh, for individuals that are returning to school that some have families, some have been out in the workforce, and now they finally have an opportunity to uh, return to school. And as you know, a lot of times uh, scholarships are not available for them. They're just for uh, high school students. So we're very proud of uh, being able to do that. Uh, the president of uh, St. Phillips is also African American, uh, Dr. Adina Lawson. And uh, as you sort of alluded to, uh, the incoming vice president of the United States is an Alpha Kappa Alpha woman. And so we are all very proud of that. And I'm sure that she is uh, very appreciative of all the divine nine who got out and pushed for the vote uh, to help uh, she and uh, Mr. Biden rise to where they are. And you're so right, all of us, uh, the younger girls in our community can look to all of us and know that there's some place that they they have a place uh, in their future. So thank you again for, for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Stanfield, I'd like for you to speak and then following you, I'd like for uh, Ms. Oselin to speak. Thank you. Um, it, it's, it's, it's pretty much have already, has already been stated by all the orga organizations represented here, but uh, just the importance of the organizations within these cities. Um, San Antonio, throughout its history, the population or percentage of African Americans in the city has always been somewhere around six to seven percent. 
And that's quite low compared to our counterparts of Houston, Dallas, and other cities where there's a larger African-American population. And San Antonio, uh, despite that low number, has been quite impressive in what we have done as a city and our divine nine organizations. Uh, these organizations were not just about having a chapter of each organization within the city, but it provided community within the city. Um, our organizations cross each other, whether it be Kappas that were married to Deltas or Kappas married to AKAs. Um, the San Antonio Register was, was uh, mentioned, which was a newspaper and the originator of that newspaper was a member of Omega Psi Phi. One of the contributors to that newspaper, J.W. Holland, was a member of Cap Alpha Psi. A lot of our organizations, if you were to look at members who have passed, uh, honorary pallbearers or friends, or members who are part of different organizations. And so, um, it was also mentioned by Sister Marilyn. I like the fact that she mentioned St. Phillips College, an HBCU, which oftentimes gets overlooked as an HBCU right here in the city of San Antonio. And so uh, these organizations, all, all of them also being college, or, uh, college organizations, college educated organizations, meant that it provided an example for the individuals here in San Antonio of higher education, of collaborative effort and binding together to do things that, and provide a voice for African-Americans in San Antonio. Um, we have the largest MLK march within the nation. That in and of itself uh, is a contributing factor because of these organizations and the work that, that we have done uh, as a divine nine from Alpha, uh, through IOTA, whether it be pharmacists, teachers, doctors, dentists, all of these things. I'm a, I'm a native of San Antonio. Um, yeah, I'm a native of San Antonio. So for me, I've been able to see how these organizations have impacted. No matter we have different mottos, creeds, or whatever, we in a sense all stand on the same foundation of wanting to provide some level of representation and a voice to our city. So that's why I'm proud of these organizations. Well, our community benefits from the fraternal and the Greek community, and the foundation was laid with our fraternal organizations, and Mr. Palmer has shown us and shared with us that history. As we move on to Ms. Osalem, will you please? Hi, yes. I just wanted to share that, you know, Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated was founded January 16, 1920. So this year, we have turned 100 years old. And although 2020 has been a most difficult year, we are still celebrating our centennial. Additionally, in our 81 years here in San Antonio, we've had the pleasure of charting three undergraduate chapters, Delta, Omicron Xi, who is, has my heart, and our most recent Upsilon, Upsilon at UTSA at San Antonio. So uh, as we continue to, to foster the ideals of scholarship, service, sisterhood, and finer womanhood, I also encourage everybody within my hearing to join us at Fiesta when we get a chance to celebrate that again as we do our Alpha Pi Zeta Fiesta track meet every year for children ages five through 12. Thank you so much. And Gwen, may I, may I just say so many people have mentioned uh, St. Philip's and we all owe a huge debt of gratitude to a Delta, the late and sainted Artemisia Bowden, who along with some support from the Episcopal Diocese here, started what became St. Philip's uh, Junior College and then St. Philip's Community College and what we have today. But believe me, it would not be what you see today without her hard work, her, uh, her political acumen, as well as her perseverance. And we support all of that and all of your contributions and uh, one of the Q&A uh, points that they wanted to make is to ensure that the Sigma Zeta relations is addressed. We addressed it earlier, the constitutional bound relationship of brother and sister, but we also know that that brother and sister bound is for all of us because we've made the Divine Nine and the political community uh, support this year, but it's every year since our charter in San Antonio. Without the fraternal organizations as our basis and this organization appealing to us to have this oral discussion, we would not be here celebrating the things that we now know. Maybe we need to dig a little deeper and get some more details so that we can share with the archivists in the future. And that is a segue to Ms. Heather Williams. Thank you, Ms. Gwen. Yes, ma'am. We at SACAM 
um, have a vision that we would like for the oral history to be collected about each and every one of the fraternal organizations uh, that have impacted San Antonio. So in that effort, we will be scheduling a interview with all of the organizations so that those interviews can go and be included in our archives so that everyone can get a broader uh, picture or broader scope of what it is that the organizations uh, have contributed from their charter uh, up into the present. Um, and those, uh, those interviews will be available on the SACAM website once they have been completed. So yes, thank you very much, Ms. Wynn, for mentioning that. Um, I think that that will conclude our presentation this morning. Uh, I do appreciate every single one of our panelists that have joined this morning. Ms. Gwen Aquindo, thank you so much for um, moderating and eloquently uh, depicting each of the contributions that these organizations have made. I appreciate your assistance with that. Um, I'd also like to thank our SACAM board, our staff members, our hardworking staff, our SACAM interns who have put forth tireless effort behind the scenes to create all of the visuals that you all have seen and some of the audio that you've seen. I'd also like to thank our SACAM volunteers. They were instrumental in making those phone calls out to people uh, within this past week in order to join today's virtual discussion. Uh, and of course, our attendees. Uh, without you, this would not be possible. So we really appreciate your attendance here today and your ongoing support. Uh, 